Hey everyone, this is Justin. I decided to switch to Marco Polo using a ShareCast to document the re reassembly of my Lexus GX after the cooling system repair. That's why I'm wearing the warmer beanie, i.e. also for head protection, as well as what Ethan affectionately refers to as my mechanics onesie. That's classic. So I will be showing you how this somewhat complicated yet simple repair comes back together, some of the tools I've been using, and some watch outs, some things I've learned in the process. So if you are just want to cheer me on, I'd appreciate it. If you have any questions about why I did something a certain way, go ahead and send a quick pull of reply. Uh, or just say, yeah, that's not my thing, and get on with life. I'll catch you later. All right, before we get too far into this, a little context for those of you who are fortunate enough to have not been spammed by me prior. Uh, we bought a 2011 GX460 last summer, uh, well used, with a 4.6 liter V8. That Toyota engine has a known issue in which a portion of the cooling system develops a leak. That part is way down deep inside the engine and difficult to get to. It's not a huge leak, but it does cause the engine to perpetually lose coolant, make deposits all over the place, and if neglected, can lead to engine overheating and other complications. So uh, we're trying to take this apart and fix it right. You know, we do things as around here right if we can, or die trying. So that's what's going on today. The disassembly part took three days just before Christmas and wasn't particularly hard. Well, there were some portions that were hard but not complicated. So we're now far into the engine and getting ready to reseal the critical part and put it back together. You are looking at the critical part. This is the valley cover plate as it's called and it goes down as a cover onto that portion of the engine. So let me take you in here. This is the actual heart of the engine, the engine block, that aluminum casting uh, this is the opening, the top of the aluminum casting that contains all the engine cylinders and running gear and everything. That is the core component of the engine. So if you damage this, you have damaged the biggest, most expensive part of the engine. So you want to be very careful when opening up the engine this far. That portion of the engine is sealed by this cover. It rests in there. And what we're doing as part of this project basically amounts to re a bathtub. Only the bathtub is, oh, 80 feet underground, <laughs> if we want to torture the analogy a little bit. So we need to reseal the flange around this cover where it connects with the engine. So we need to apply new sealant along this flange here. I've scraped off all the old stuff that was defective. Didn't require much scraping because it had lost its adhesion. It was kind of brittle and railed. And that's why these engines develop the leaks that they do. And the crime scene-like appearance here is due to the fact that Toyota coolant is pink. So as it leaks out, it leaves behind the solid residue of the dissolved content of the engine coolant once the water and the glycol are gone. So we're going to reseal this. Get the sealant on, let it pre-cure, reassemble the valley cover plate, and then try to clean up as much of that pink scuzz as possible. All right, let's talk about sealant and what kind of sealants should be used for this. The factory sealant, or FIPG, a form-in-place gasket. In other words, it's a gasket that's formed in the manufacturing process, not as a separate piece. So there is no separate piece that seals this part to the valley tray, it is just a sealant, a caulk-like compound. Most people would use an RTV, RTV standing for Room Temperature Vulcanizing. In other words, it's a form of liquid elastomer rubber that cures at room temperature. Uh, that can be very useful because you can put it on there, set it up, it'll cure. But my experience has been that curing sealants sometimes aren't the way to go. And it's useful to have a sealant that'll stay liquid and flow in and seal the gaps. Uh, there's a company that developed a non-curing sealant for Rolls-Royce to use in their jet engines in the 80s. That company marketed their product as Hylomar. And the distinctive feature of that sealant is that it does not cure. It's essentially 
like a toothpaste and it dries and it stays sticky like toothpaste. In fact, let's head over to the toolbox here and show you. This is their original product. It is a blue sealing paste, just like that. And it looks just like toothpaste. It is a little sticky, just like toothpaste. And it never fully cures. It sets up when you spread it out. It has the consistency of nuclear strength post-it note glue, is how I'll describe it. And like that post-it note glue, it will stay uh, uncured and allow you to reattach and attach and things and reposition things. So you would get a lot more forgiveness with this than you would with like an RTV because an RTV sealant, once it's cured, it's cured. And if you goofed it up in any way, the only option is scrape it off, start all over. So this is a non-curing sealant. The Hylomar Red is a variant that's called a semi-curing sealant. And that is you apply it the same way the blue stuff does. It like gives you the all the advantages of a non-curing sealant during assembly. But then once you put it together, it will cure when the engine gets hot. And it locks it in place. So if you goof this up, you won't know it <laughs> until you start things up. Uh, and only then will it cure. It doesn't fully cure like set up and get hard. It just gets a little stiffer. And uh, this gives you a lot of forgiveness when you're putting things together. And that's really important for this application because this valley cover plate shows some evidence that it wasn't the highest quality part. If you look at the reflection of the machining marks around the edge, it looks like it was reworked or remachined, touched up at the factory. You know, um, I'll spare you the details of how you know that. Some of you, some of you colleagues would know why that is a giveaway. So I'm not sure this is as flat as it could be. I have some concerns that the gap in this flange could be two or three thousandths, which may be problematic for resealing. So that suggests that part of the reason this leaks isn't just that the factory sealant was inappropriate, but also that maybe this cover plate wasn't the best design. Maybe the flange is a little too thin to avoid warpage with thermal cycles, that kind of thing. Maybe there's some residual stress in the casting, who knows. Uh, to die cast shouldn't be, shouldn't have a lot of residual stress in it though, I would think. Anyway, we're gonna get to sealing this. The procedure for using this is to put the sealant on, mate the parts, let them sit for a minute to share sealing, and then pull it apart and then let it dry. And after 10 minutes, you put it back together and it's ready to go. And that's what we'll do. One of the trickier parts of this reinstallation as we get ready to put our sealant down and do the initial imprinting on the valley is that when you actually install the valley plate, you have to install this coolant crossover line as well. And it mates with, um, down inside here, there's a, there's a receptacle that comes out so the coolant can get to the water pump. And of course there are two O-rings that seal this and a lot of people struggle getting the O-rings in there and they want to roll up out. And of course you've got wet open sealant while you're fighting those O-rings. People struggle with that. That's where this stuff comes in. Seal Glide, it's a silicone grease, a silicone lubricant. Put some of that stuff on the O-rings on here, grease them up good, and those O-rings will just slide right in. This stuff is inert, won't react with coolant. Don't have to worry about that. So if you're working with silicone, uh, we're working with O-rings, silicone lube is a better choice than anything petroleum-based. Petroleum stuff tends to interact with certain kinds of elastomers and swell them and cause them to fail. I'll tell you a quick story. An engine project at work had experienced cooling system O-rings failures after the engine went through production test. All of the O-rings in the cooling system failed. And it turns out in that case, the cause of it was a biodegradable anti-corrosive wash that was kind of vegetable oil based that they were using on the engine instead of paint. And the natural bio oils, similar to like biodiesel, uh, would, were reacting with the elastomer of those O-rings, causing them to swell, turn to putty, 
and all the cooling systems just started puking coolant down to everywhere. We ended up having to change the O-ring material to an O-ring that is compatible with the vegetable stuff. Most of your O-rings in the engine are designed for coolant compatibility. They're not designed to be compatible with grease, gasoline, diesel fuel, anything, or even Vaseline for that matter. So when using, when using O-rings, in particular any O-rings in the cooling system, use a silicone-based grease. All right, we've applied the sealant and done the initial transfer, what they call imprinting. What we're looking for here is a continuous bead of relatively tacky stuff. And boy, is this stuff tacky on both surfaces. So we've got it on the pan, on the valley plate down there, on the plate, and we've got it on the block surface as well. You know, it occurred to me that because that is the actual surface of the engine block, I think a lot of people doing this repair don't understand how important it is to not use any kind of power scraper or steel scraper on that surface because it's aluminum. It's gonna be fairly soft. If you're trying to clean off old sealant with something that's damaging the surface, you're defeating the whole purpose of your repair. So go slowly, use a plastic scraper, uh, something like this little Harbor Freight Junkie here, with a plastic razor blade, um, or use, you know, something like this. Glass, uh, this has glass in it though, so it, it could theoretically damage the surface. I didn't notice any damage though in using it. So just go slowly. We're going to let this flash off for about 10 minutes. And then, uh, then we'll cook with gasoline and get this thing bolted back together. I've got a special treat for you to show you when we do that. All right, we've got our valley cover plate on, sealant. And all of our fasteners are loosely installed. And we've got the water cross over here with our nicely silicone greased O-rings. Everything went together pretty well. It's time to tighten down the fasteners. <clears throat> and the reason I'm pausing here to remark is that I think a lot of technicians and mechanics, and especially DIY types, make a big mistake when they're doing repair work and they look at torque specs. And when you look at repair, oh, it's supposed to be tightened to this amount of torque, this amount of torque. It's 22 foot pounds or it's 18 foot pounds or the wheels have to be 15 foot pounds. When you're dealing with fasteners like this that are fairly corroded and dirty and don't go cleanly into their holes, that factory torque spec is completely irrelevant. Let me repeat that. The torque spec is irrelevant. The factory torque specs are designed to produce a certain amount of stretch in the fastener. The torque is just a means to an end to get a certain amount of stretch. A screw is an inclined plane wrapped around a cylinder. Right? It's just a ramp. And we're using that ramp to get leverage to stretch a, screw, a bolt and turn it into a very stiff spring. So what we want, we want to do is we want to stretch these a certain amount. And in, with new threads and clean factory conditions, there is a torque spec that will give a calibrated amount of stretch. In a repair situation with gunk in the threads, rusty bolts, radically different amounts of friction in there, that torque spec can be off by 100%. To get the same stretch as the factory would get at 20 foot-pounds, you might have to do 40 foot-pounds. So there are ways to do some math about the stretch, and I'll spray all the engineering nerdiness about it, getting a certain amount of stretch depending on the length, of, the grip length of the fastener and all that. Basically, tighten it down until it's snug and do a certain number of degrees um, to get a certain amount of stretch. But in a repair situation like this, guten tight, as they say, is not the end of the world. A lot of people want to do this false precision. They're kidding themselves. A torque spec applied to a repair situation like this with, is not pr a precision measure at all. But there is still some utility in using a torque wrench or something to that effect. And that is if the fasteners are in similar condition, then you can have the tightness be even. And evenness and consistency of, of fastening matters more than the precision that it happens to be. In this case, I'm going to achieve a reasonable amount of precision by using a cordless ratchet. This has a maximum torque of 30 foot-pounds. 30 foot-pounds for an M8 would normally be excessive, especially into aluminum. But with these corroded fasteners, it's going to get us about in the neighborhood we want to be. 
So this should get us close to a pretty even amount of stretch. Now, of course, being a pattern here, we don't want to just start it here and go around. We want to start in the middle, kind of crisscross, work diagonally, work your way out. So start here, go across, move down one, down here, then jump over here. And then, of course, you do the ends dead last. So this should be the last one. That should be the last one back there. So just a quick comment on that. I'm going to go ahead and torque this down, get it good and tight, and then we'll start to clean up, hopefully, a lot of that disgusting residue that's all over the outside so we can verify the integrity of our repair. All right, valid plate's in, and we're installing the knock sensors now. I want to draw your attention to a little engineering detail Toyota does on this bolt. This one screw holds a, a bracket, basically, or a brace that ties the knock sensor wiring harness down and keeps it from vibrating all over the place. But notice how the bracket has the ends bent around this casting. That, now why would you do that? It's so that when you tighten it down, it doesn't twist. You don't need two hands to hold it in place. To the contrary, you can totally tighten this down with one hand on the tool and not need at all any kind of um, second hand to prevent that thing from rotating. This also prevents stress on the wire harness when you put it together. Just those little details that you notice when you start putting something together. It's like, huh, that's pretty smart. Okay, we have the knock sensor harness in, four knock sensors, as you see here. And that's about as clean as I can get the coolant residue. There's just too many nooks and crannies. I don't have a brush that's capable of that. So I scrubbed it down with Dawn best I could with a brush and did some compressed air and shop vac to try to clean off the mess best I could. Just to comment here on a couple of these clips and wire harness, like, okay, when I took this out, I did not remove any of these clips. This is the valley of a V8 engine. It gets hot. I was concerned that these clips, after years of sitting in the heat, would be brittle and take them apart would break this. In which case, then that likely means a new harness, which is a dealer-only part. I'm sure it takes a long time to get here. All the things. So I wanted to take it apart in a way that would assure I could get it back together. Unfortunately, disassembling that at the back is unavoidable as well as these plastic clips here that hold the harness in place. So I want to suggest to you a small pick, like a little O-ring pick. Get in there and use those. So the O-ring pick can get under that latch, let you wiggle that back and forth and take that out without breaking the latch. So don't fight these connectors. Don't just try to force them. They will break and you will lose. These guys, these clips right here, let's go here because the lighting will allow you to kind of see head on. If you look down inside there, you can see there's a stud in the middle that's threaded into the manifold. And then there's two fingers essentially on either side of that inside there. These clips, uh, the fingers act like a check valve. As you push the clip on, they go on the threads on the stud and they grab it. So to get these clips out, you have to stick a small pick and separate those fingers off there and gently lift, lift it as you do. You have to hold both of them separated. Remember, when Toyota engineers these engines, and indeed when most companies engineer their engines, they're not designed to be easy to work on. They're designed to be easy for the factory to put together. So they wanted to engineer a clip and retaining system that could just be pushed on and have no quality control processes really need. There's no torque spec with these. Easy peasy, so clip, clip, clip. But for you, the mechanic or homeowner, trying to work on these things, you'll need a good set of picks to get these apart in one piece. A lot of people just break them and pop them off, and then what'll happen is, when these wires flop around, you'll end up cracking the wires in the back of the connector here, and get weird fault codes. And guess how much fun it is to dive this far into an engine to replace something as, chintzy, as cheap as a knock sensor. Yeah, not fun. So. Don't cut corners, don't be lazy. Go slow, pace yourself, you'll be glad you did. Okay, we've got our PCV manifold installed. 
There's a little nipple that goes in the rubber ring on that side. And there's a connection at the back here that plugs in. And of course, there's a really Toyota right here. This little screw that comes in from the back. Of course, you've got to get it around that EGR tube. Between that ear and that ear, you've got to start the screw coming forward and get a tool on it. Yeah, real fun. Anyway, this is in. And I think we're ready to put the EGR cooler in. All right, EGR cooler. It's not in, we're just getting the layout. This has a hot flange here for the exhaust with a gasket on it. There's a stud that has to go in because you can't get a bolt in there and they've engineered it. So you gotta, yeah, tricky. So pretty straightforward. There is a hose goes down to the east coolant cover plate, pulls coolant out of the cover plate we sealed and pulls it up here to the inlet. Now, the basic Toyota-ness of this isn't too bad other than that has a screw that goes in it and it goes in that hole. And you're supposed to get it, get it in there in that position through there. Yeah. Ugh. Yep, fun times. Anyway, here we go. This is an example of the kind of thing you will encounter regularly on this. You gotta get a flex head ratchet down way back there, up against the firewall, with an e-torque socket on it. That'd be an E8. To screw in the studs, now you can then put the nuts on the back of those studs. Yeah, uh-huh, and then way down there, if you can see that hole, we gotta get a screw in there and mount this EGR cooler. Fun times. Well, let me see if I can get you a shot of it here. But if you look in the mirror, we got that screw in. Not very easy. But when you're working at the back of the engine with zero accessibility, well, I won't say zero, obviously I got it in, but very challenging accessibility, let's say, dropping a screw is a, will ruin your day. That's why you need to put some painter's tape in your socket and just jam that screw in there because Dropping it is just unacceptable. So, all right, the tough part of that EGR cooler bolt installation appears to be done. We'll get those nuts on the studs at the flange in the back. So back here, we'll put those nuts on and we'll get busy. EGR cooler's in. And since we've spent a lot of time in the Superman position with knees on the radiator and chin way back by the firewall, we're gonna take a short break, eat some lunch, come back and get to it. Sometimes you're gonna end up with a lot of really rusted parts or parts that need to be reconditioned before you put them back on. This is an EGR crossover line that takes the EGR out of the cooler and brings it up to the intake manifold. Now the, fasten the fastening hardware here, it got a little rusty, <clears throat> no doubt from all the coolant that was getting near it. So we've taken some Scotch-Brite and removed most of the free rust on a Dremel tool. And now we're just gonna hit it with some cold galvanizing compound to give it a little bit of sacrificial layer of some zinc. And that should help it last. Now, the plating on this is likely an electroless nickel, which is why it's mostly not rusty. Um, but uh, the cold galvanizing will give us a good little bit of corrosion resistance and it's cheap. I think, it'll, well, not cheap, but a little half pint like that goes a long, long way. So it's worth it. It'll buy you some time and it keeps you from having to replace a part like this, which is pretty expensive. This is probably about 120, 150 bucks. So we'll be able to reuse it and give it a new lease on life with some cold galvanizing compound. All right, the EGR cooler crossover tube, oops, crossover tube is in. Uh, that's the cold galvanizing job we did. Nothing fancy, just a little zinc rich paint basically going on there buy us a little more time as far as corrosion on that tube and maybe prevent a premature failure so that's not a very fast corroding part so i'm guessing that's the zinc coating on there might be the difference between hailing in 20 years instead of 12 more so not a super big deal all right time to pivot more to the front of the engine we've got uh crossover manifold to put here and here coolant and then we got to get our thermostat housing and water plumbing back on here to go down to our little radiator hose so 
Uh, we'll be working on the front end of the engine for a while. Check in with you in a bit. So while I'm in there, I'm going to put a new thermostat in. And of course, you can't just buy a thermostat. It has to come as an assembly with a fancy housing, a new seal and everything. So you take these three bolts apart and, oh no, how did it go together? Is it this way? What if you forget the way it's pointed? Well, Japanese engineering has you covered because that's not a perfect triangle. It's skewed. And there is only one way this thing will go together and have everything line up. And if you don't line it up the way it's supposed to go, it won't fit. But when you do, ta-da. So Japanese engineering's got you covered. It's a concept called poke yoke. And I think just about every engineering company worth their salt does that today. But a lot of people don't know about those little details, so I thought I'd share it with you. Okay, we're gonna call it a day there. Got the EGR cooler and standpipe in on top of the PCV manifold, on top of the valley plate gasket, and got all that buttoned up and tied down. We got our new thermostat here on the end of that little water manifold, and put the water manifold back onto the water pump flange. And I think tomorrow we can put the serpentine belt back on, put the new one on. I was going to replace that lower radiator hose because, you know, why not? You're in there anyway, right? Yeah, that's easier said than done. So we're making the perfectly functional old hose be perfectly functional as a new hose because that thing would be a bear to get out. So we're making good progress. We will see you tomorrow.